Okay, it's uh, 2 p.m. in Singapore on Friday, 25th June, 2021. So let's get started. On behalf of the Singh Health Duke and US Global Health Institute, I'm delighted to welcome all of you. I'm Amina Mahmood, I'm Deputy Director of the Institute, and this talk today is part of our monthly global health seminar series. In these sessions, we draw on our faculty as well as guest speakers to present topics which are of importance and in global health, and we want to engage with our community in Singapore and beyond. So please, at any time, do send us any suggestions you have of topics um, that you'd like to hear about. We try to cover quite a wide range. So today, we're going to be talking about uh, looking at uh, prevention and management of non-communicable -commun diseases in Cambodia. Uh, and presenting this topic is Professor David Matcher. He is Professor of the Health Services and Systems Research Program at Duke and US Medical School, and he was a program's inaugural director for 10 years. He's also Professor of Medicine at Duke University in the US. David has worked in clinical research for over 35 years. His work primarily relates to stroke and other chronically sorry, disabling neurologic disorders as well as, as well as clinical and public policy analysis. While the content of his research spans a range of clinical medicine, his work has involved bringing together researchers from multiple disciplines under a common conceptual framework. His overarching goal has been to promote the use of best evidence to support clinical and public policy decision making. He, he addresses the fundamental challenge of how to bridge the gap between analysts and decision makers. A challenge made more difficult when the issues involve multiple stakeholders, competing priorities, and are complex in details and uh, dynamics. Currently, Professor Match is studying the effectiveness of public health interventions against COVID-19 and has developed a model to estimate the number of COVID-19 infection cases and deaths in Singapore under different public health interventions compared to containment interventions implemented in Singapore. So I'm really delighted to have him present today. Uh, part of the presentation will also be done by Nirmali, who is his senior research associate at HSSR. Um, I'll also mention that this topic is particularly relevant to me as I was also a co-investigator in this study. So I'm delighted to have the whole team here today. Before I hand over to David, a few housekeeping notes. Please keep yourself on mute. Uh, the whole time. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, and if you have questions, you can put them in the chat box at any point, but we'll be addressing it at the end of the presentation. So with that, I'll, I'll say welcome, David. Thank you very much for being with us today, and hand over to you. Okay, great. Thanks, uh, thanks, Amina. I really appreciate uh, the chance to talk about this topic, and I do apologize for what sounds like a fairly complicated title, um, and also, uh, you gave me a lovely introduction, but basically, I am a, I'm a, a, a an intern, a, an internal medicine physician. Uh, do, I do a bunch of research, and my major interest actually is in in common clinical conditions, uh, and primary care is one of my big uh, my my big interests. Um, you know, how can we provide better primary care? Um, and most of my work has been done in in, in developed countries, um, mostly the United States and then Singapore, but only in the last few years through um, some connections with colleagues in the UK and then in, in Cambodia, um, became involved in a project uh, starting, I think around uh, 2014, 2015, um, uh, with a, uh, uh, it was initiated by a, a colleague who was heading up the US uh, CDC in Cambodia. Uh, and uh, his interest was, he sort of saw the writing on the wall, or at least what he imagined was the writing on the wall, which is that, you know, that a lot of the efforts in countries like Cambodia to focus on uh, specific infectious diseases and kind of treat, treat, treat issues in vertical silos um, was sort of coming to an end, at least that's how he perceived it. And that funding, for example, for HIV was going to start to dry up and that, that it was time to start thinking about really where the, um, where the important problems were in, in, in less developed countries, low and middle income countries, and, um, and uh, got me involved in a project with him to, to start to examine what are the opportunities in Cambodia. And, um, and that led to this whole series of projects that I'll talk about. Uh, next slide. So this was really, uh, this is very much a collaboration uh, amongst a number of of individuals and um, 
so you mentioned normally and, and John Ansa, who was a, a, uh, our, our, uh, simula our, our modeler who did develop uh, the, the uh, mechanics of the modeling that we did to estimate the impact of, of uh, non-communicable diseases in Cambodia and the potential uh, impact both health and economic on that. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, Amina, as you know, and then a series of other individuals. I do want to mention um, our colleagues uh, in Cambodia. Uh, we work very closely with Cyan uh, uh, Yi and, uh, and, and uh, uh, Trump uh, Pia, uh, and um, who have been just incredibly helpful in pulling this together and actually doing much of the work on the ground, especially during the uh, COVID period uh, when we couldn't uh, meet face to face. And also we've had very, very close relationship with the um, uh, Ministry of Health in, and it says Ministry of Health Singapore, it means Ministry oh. to, to the Ministry of Health Cambodia. Actually, uh, they were very, very central to this and, and were in, indeed um, key investigators on this project. So I just wanted to thank all the people involved. And there are even more people um, that are not listed. Uh, next slide. Um, just to get you oriented, here's Cambodia. Uh, next slide. So uh, I, I guess for all of us who, I guess most of us are for, are in the region. So I don't think I have to explain to every, everyone the geography of Cambodia, but um, it is um, it is a has been a low income country. It is it is is advancing to becoming a um, a low middle income country uh, has a lot of external investment coming in, particularly from China. Um, and uh, there's sort of a good news, bad news story about Cambodia in terms of non communicable diseases, uh, or excuse me, in terms of health. So you see that, um, that the good news, and you can just play this slide through um, there, that um, we've seen. Um, from the bad news is that non-communicable diseases have been rising uh, over the years. And this is the most recent estimates from 2019 um, from the global burden of disease estimates. But overall, the number of deaths have been going down largely because of the decrease in communicable diseases, maternity, uh, prenatal and nutritional conditions, which is where a lot of the international efforts have been made to um, address health issues in countries like Cambodia. Next slide. Um, so um, th these are really uh, important targets. I think there's a recognition now that you know these are not just you know conditions. They're not just diseases. They are they are manifest in in very substantial, uh, very disabling ways. And so cardiovascular disease um, uh, manifests. And then just I think there's one more slide here. Um, the kinds of complications you get associated with diabetes and hypertension, which to me are kind of the the cornerstone uh, 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 issues, which are not only um, which are not only uh, the leading uh, some of the leading factors that influence the development of cardiovascular disease, but also are rising in incidence uh, and prevalence in uh, in in uh, developing countries. Um, that we're talking about things that, without a doubt, heart attacks, heart failure, stroke, these you know loss of legs blindness, kidney failure, these are big deals. Okay, next slide. Um, now, the, the, uh, the interesting thing, like most places, expenditures in healthcare is rising in Cambodia, um, but because of increasing investment, increasing GDP in the country, actually the investment uh, or the amount of, of health expenditures relative to GDP is dropping. Um, and uh, what, where that money is mostly coming from is out-of-pocket uh, costs that really over the years, if you look at the sequence of costs over the years, they've been pretty stable at 60% out-of-pocket, uh, government uh, about 22%, and um, donors, namely NGOs and so on, uh, accounting for the remainder. Um, next slide. And a really super simple uh, visualization of the, the, the structure of the health system. So. Uh, kind of from the top down, the Ministry of Health, which um, is overseeing the national hospitals and specialty centers, uh, many of which, most of which are within the major cities such as Phnom Penh. Um, then at the intermediate level, at the provinces, there are provincial hospitals, which are, um, which um, have much lower levels of capability, but um, 
but are the places where you'll find doctors. And then you have more uh, uh, the, at the peripheral level, you have mostly health centers, uh, most of which are not uh, manned by or not staffed by physicians, but, but uh, nurses and not generally even nurse practitioners. Next slide. Um, so again, just uh, the, the health centers are the point of first contact uh, for most people. And, and really, they've been, they've been developed and supported for the treatment of communicable diseases. And so they have pretty well-developed programs for maternity child health and uh, things like TB, uh, HIV, uh, malaria, HIV. And actually, HIV has been sort of sliced out and has its own set of centers, um, which are really quite well um, I mean, in the scheme of things, are really quite well um, uh, uh, positioned in, in terms of funding and, and resources. Um, and then, as I mentioned, there are referral hospitals and then national, uh, more national uh, hospitals, which have uh, just a increasing uh, capabilities. Um, but again, to visit, if you visit Cambodia compared to Singapore, um, it is a noticeable difference, even at the national level. Um, next slide. So um, there's pr the private sector um, is, is really a dominant place where people receive services. They're often, people often uh, go to either small practices or they go to uh, pharmacies. Uh, dr drugs are available over the counter without a prescription. Um, and, um, and so really pharmacists provide a lot of the direct, um, the direct care um, for, for most individuals. Um, and so there's sort of a big gap in terms of you know, people who need more, more advanced services, um, in order for them to get uh, physician services through, the, through government programs, generally would have to go to a referral hospital. And those may be something on the order of 70 kilometers away um, from your, your average rural community. Um, next slide. Now, um, several years ago, prior to our starting this, or around the time we were starting this, this series of projects with, with Cambodia, um, there was an initiative called, which involved multiple sectors of the government to uh, develop an action plan for non-communicable diseases. Um, and it was an effort, uh, you know, kind of to bring together, um, uh, you know, several government agencies, including the Ministry of Health. So it was not really looking at it purely from the perspective of, of uh, medical services but also things like uh, prevention, exercise, nutrition, you know, availability of more, more nutritious foods, uh, less salt, that kind of stuff. Next slide. Um, now, um, the, the, the Ministry of Health from their, from their side really um, are very much influenced, had been very much influenced by the, um, the initiatives from the, from the WHO to uh, develop capabilities to, to address non-communicable diseases. They already had data, some preliminary data that was showing that these, the incidence of these conditions uh, or the prevalence of these conditions was rising. And so the, the Ministry of Health in Cambodia um, started with saying, yes, we embrace what's called the PEN package or the package of essential non-communicable disease services that was um, disseminated by the WHO um, and that they wanted to create a version of that, uh, that package for Cambodia. And these are just a couple of the protocols. They're, they're basically designed not as, um, as, as protocols that kind of guide you in what you should be doing, but not really how you should be doing it. And, and that'll become relevant as I show you some of the work we've done um, with, with, um, in Cambodia later. Next. Um, so... So really, we, we started our work thinking about, um, about really what, um, you, you know, how the various tasks that are embedded in the, in the PEN package could be implemented on the ground and sort of deconstructed the PEN package, or it was really easily deconstructed. But, you know, you want to identify people, you want to assess their risk, you want to make a decision about treatment and treat them according to protocol, follow them up appropriately, you know, bring them back if they don't show, you know, contact them. Uh, to make to increase the chance that they'll show up and that they'll be adherent to medication, and then also that there's a mechanism for sending people to a higher level facility um, if they have needs that fall outside of the protocol, 
um, or have other, con in particular, if they have other conditions um, or if they're not responding to the protocol. So next slide. So um, it, for our part, we came up with a series of four projects or four efforts. Uh, uh, we call them four stages going from sentiment to action. So everybody says they want to they want to do something and improve, uh, you know, the quality of care for blah, blah, blah. And that's what I call a sentiment. That's not something that you can do anything with. It's not something that you can you can measure. Um, but step number one was to make to identify that there indeed was that there is a, a, a public policy um, uh, desire, pressure, interest in, in, in systematically improving NCD care. And in doing that, we developed um, what we call a group model building exercise with stakeholders. And I'll talk about that in a moment. But just to establish, yes, what's the foundation? You know, is there a, is there a general agreement that this is, a, this is an area that everybody is, that's important to everybody? And, and also where are the, where are the, the aspects of uh, NCD care? Where the, where the leverage points that are really crucial to improve? So the next slide is uh, was then to say, okay, to the extent, and now if we just if there's a, there's this decision that we want to move forward, how do we move forward? Given that um, the implementation has to be done in a variety of sites, and in some of our experiences, uh, in my personal experiences in doing uh, healthcare implementation in 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 community sites, is that every site seems to be very different, and the kinds of interventions that you need to develop uh, may be may need to be tailored to the site. So we uh, we wanted to better understand what the sites were like in which NCD care, this Cambodia version of the pen package, would be implemented, and then create a toolkit that would that would be suitable for use in that kind in those in that those sites, and if necessary, to tailor those tools to the different kinds of sites. Next slide. So, um, so then the third stage, which is where we are right now, um, we're in the midst of, of um, identifying uh, some funding opportunities to, to go in and take this toolkit and, uh, uh, and pilot it and um, finalize uh, it in a, in a version that actually we can go next stage after that. Uh, next slide is to, is to implement it more nationally. Now at stage three, we would like to not just pilot it, we also would like to do a trial if that's possible, but unfortunately trials tend to be expensive. So we may be able to do an advanced pilot, um, but, and it may be that, that at a national level, uh, the, the ministry will be satisfied with a, with a strong pilot without having a formal um, uh, comparative trial. N uh, next slide. So in the stage one exercise, um, some of, some of the people here may have been involved in what we call a group model building exercise. We've done some in Singapore for a variety of issues. We did this in Cambodia and brought together stakeholders from, um, which included government providers um, uh, um, and, and people at the provincial level. Um, unfortunately, we did not have people who were from the Ministry of Finance that's well, another name in Cambodia, but in any case, we didn't have them there. For some reason, they didn't show up. But what we, we did was constructed a model that rep, uh, well, a, a, a visual representation that describes how people develop uh, non-communicable diseases, how they develop complications, and what are the factors that potentially influence the, those flows, and uh, including being identified, being, having, having their conditions identified Getting, getting to treatment, getting treated to target, and then potentially developing or avoiding, avoiding the development of complications. Um, next slide. And um, real quickly, the sort of the, uh, um, well, we looked at, um, at some of the impact of national services. So we looked at things like increasing the, the uptake of diabetes and hypertension treatment, smoking cessation in addition. Um, and came to the conclusion basically that um, uh, these are sort of four, and perhaps they're trivial, but they were actually but trivial uh, insights in some level. But by having gone through the exercise, the participants actually uh, felt that they were, you know, that they they really understood them. Number one was 
no big deal. If we do something, we will decrease non-communicable disease incidence and prevalence compared to what would have happened under the status quo. Number two, um, while all policies will reduce the incidence of complicated non-communicable diseases, it will, um, they will only moderate the prevalence of complicated, uh, um, uh, of complicated non-communicable diseases. Okay, and part of that has to do with the fact that just identifying people with disease and even getting them to treatment doesn't guarantee that they're gonna be treated to target and that they're gonna persist and they're gonna have availability of medications. Um, and, um, and also, uh, to some extent, treatment is going to cause people with more complicated non-communicable diseases to survive longer, which then gets you to bullet point three, which is deaths from non-communicable diseases will be reduced, but you know, the downside to people not dying is that now all these people with non-communicable diseases are gonna remain alive. Uh, you know, it's not bad news, bad news, but it's, but the point is, is that, that you don't necessarily save money if you have, to, you still have expenses for the care of people who have non-communicable diseases who are now alive, who would have been dead. Um, and then the last is sort of a, uh, an important point that people tend to forget, um, which is that there is a fairly long period where you're spending more money than you're saving. And, and that's, that's just, uh, you know, that while you may not, and, and even if you're not net saving money in the long run, whatever moderating effect on costs that your program is going to have will take several years to manifest. Next slide. So they said, well, okay, um, uh, let's, you know, th there was an acceptance that, yes, we understand all this. We're ready to move forward. And so we went to the second stage, which was the developing the toolkit. So this was something that was funded and, 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 uh, and Amina was, our, uh, was co PI on this project and, and normally participated heavily, John as well. But we, we did a lot of work with local stakeholders in Siem Reap province. And we did two things. One is we met with stakeholders face to face um, in a session and did um, another form of group exercise to better understand what are the challenges to implementing the, uh, uh, the pen package? So we had to describe the package and then go through what, what the barriers were at the local sites and, and then try to um, organize those. Um, did a formal capacity survey, which uh, normally I'll describe, uh, did a comprehensive literature review of, of tools that are available internationally, um, or at least, at least focusing on the WHO pen package implementation in Asian contexts. And then um, finally did a, a, a detailed evaluation of the toolkit that we developed as a consequence. Uh, next slide. Uh, this was the meeting of the, excuse me, of the local stakeholders. Um, everybody looks good. Um, one thing I learned in Cambodia is do not delay lunch. Okay, so that's a lesson to be learned. Okay, next slide. So this is a little busy slide, but basically it was, to me, was a good way of summarizing um, the, the results of the exercise, which said, you know, people don't, uh, you know, people are not getting their, um, uh, are not getting uh, their NCDs managed. And, you know, what were the dominant reasons for that and how did they cluster together? Um, and so, you know, issuing issues around people uh, don't show up for screening, they don't value what screening provides, they don't like the health centers, you know? So these were all, all issues. And then there's other issues that have to do with, um, you know, you know they, they, they feel like they're not gonna get service, that's, that the quality of care is not gonna be high, that they're not gonna have medications available. Um, you know, then there's issues around not understanding what NCDs are. Um, and then there's the issues around, um, around access because especially in rural communities, even the health centers are not necessarily, you know, a hop, skip, and a jump from, from the, the villages. And definitely the regional health, the regional hospitals are, can be quite far away. And I think on average, they're 30 kilometers, some are as much as 70 kilometers away. Next slide. So uh, now I'm not gonna turn it now to normally and, and to describe the survey. Thanks, David. Um, so this, yeah, this, the next part of uh, our work was to conduct a capacity survey. 
um, among health centers in Simri province. Um, and so uh, Dr. Siani, who is our co-PI for the project, um, and, and PR from the, um, from the Kana Center for Population Health Research, were quite he heavily involved in um, making sure that this survey was completed in Simri. So uh, essentially what we did, there were about 91 health centers in the Simri province at that time. And so we, um, we surveyed 50% of them, so 45 health centers, and we uh, stratified the sample according to geographical location and the number of health centers in each district. Um, and we used a questionnaire that has already been developed by um, the WHO um, to uh, on a capacity survey. And we checked this at the stakeholder meeting. We went through the questions, um, and there were not no major changes that were that were um, suggested. So we went ahead with this questionnaire. We translated in, it into Kamaya. Um, so this is a, a description of the geographical locations that we conducted the sites in. So there, uh, the question, uh, survey in, there were four districts in Simri province. Um, most health centers cover a population size of 10,000 to 15,000 people. And most of them are accessible within a two hour uh, walk to the nearest uh, referral hospital. Um, so this slide shows you the number of uh, visits on any given day to the health center in general, and then on uh, for NCD specific visits. Um, so most health centers had between 30 to 50 visits in the previous day, um, but the majority of them are for communicable diseases, for maternal and child health, um, and so very, very few visits for in NCDs. So a third of uh, health centers reported no NCD related visits in the last day. Um, about a third had between one to four. Um, so still, yeah, very low um, use of NCD related services. Um, in terms of human resources, we looked at the number of nurses that were present. Um, most health centers had between one to two health cent uh, nurses, excluding absentees um, in the, on that day. Um, but as you can see, nurse absenteeism rates are quite high. So almost half of health centers reported at least one nurse being absent on that day. Um, when it comes to basic equipment, all health centers uh, reported having at least one or two blood pressure monitoring devices that were functional. Um, but when it came to glucometers, about 10% of health centers reported that they didn't have any uh, glucometers um, in, at, the, at the health centers, and most of them reported um, just one. Um, in terms of medicine availability, so 13% of health centers said they didn't have any uh, basic hypertension or diabetes meds available. About 78% said they had at least one, um, and about 9 to 10% said they had both. Um, but if you look at the specific disease uh, conditions that they had medicines for, the majority of them were for hypertension only. Um, and 64% uh, of them said they had um, HD, HCTZ meds. Um, but when you look at diabetes, 91% of health centers reported no uh, diabetes um, medication available um, at that time. Um, finally, we, we wanted to construct a measure to assess the degree of administrative capacity at the health center. So we used um, nurse absenteeism rates and whether or not a, the blood pressuring monitoring devices um, had been calibrated. Um, and so we constructed a, 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 an index for low, medium, high capacity. And most health centers had um, a medium level of capacity um, and 21% were reported as having low capacity. That means that they had um, a, at least one nurse that was absent on, on that day, as well as reported never calibrating their blood pressure monitoring devices. Um, so we use this information to finally construct a readiness index. And this is um, an index that has been developed and uh, published in other studies, uh, which takes the five main domains that are in the survey um, and uh, totals 
totals it across the number of items that they report available. Um, average it out and you get one figure. And usually a, a, a primary care center is support, supposed to be ready if they report a level of over 70%. Um, so as you can see across the domains, they, um, none of the domains, just one for essential services reported um, uh, a readiness level of over 70%. Um, and, but across the board, you can see there isn't much of a difference between rural and uh, non-rural health centers. Um, when you look at health centers by their level of training, so there was a question that asked whether they had been trained in, in the WHO pen and about a third of uh, health centers had reported training. You can see that it still doesn't make much of a difference in, in to, across uh, the different domains. The only uh, notice, noticeable difference we saw was in counseling services. Um, so uh, health centers that had reported having been trained in the pen reported that they provided counseling services for basic risk factors um, and for diabetes self-management, um, things like that. Um, so our key findings from this is it's one of the first studies in Cambodia to evaluate readiness of the primary health care system for managing NCDs. While some health centers deliver a limited set of services, none of them meet uh, the WHO recommendations on the minimum threshold for managing NCDs. And while health centers seem to be generally similar and lacking key capabilities um, and processes for implementing the pen, the intensity of these challenges could be different. And that's something that we need to look into as we um, move into the next stage of this project. Um, so having this information with us uh, from the capacity survey, we next conducted a literature review of uh, similar tools that had been implemented uh, for uh, achieving the function, functional specifications of the pen uh, in Asia. And we had uh, an MD student uh, come in and um, uh, work on this, on this scoping review. So these are some the key concepts that, that were used in in the review. Um, so we looked at PubMed, these were the records, the number of records that were screened, identified, and finally we ended up with about 56 um, studies, um, trials that were considered. So we wanted to look at both the challenges um, as well as the, the key tools that had been, had been implemented. And so the key challenges that were identified were um, planning, there's a lack of coordination between key stakeholders. There's limited equipment and medicines available, a shortage of staff, um, other things like long waiting times, um, an inability for daily wage earners to visit clinics during working hours, um, and things like that. Yeah. So using the, the, the tools that we found through the literature review and general um, searches, we constructed uh, a set of preliminary tools uh, based on the, the functional specifications that we identified previously. And we, we presented these and evaluated them at two meetings that were held with key stakeholders. The first was in December, 2020. Um, so this was a, a virtual meeting, uh, local stakeholders met in person, and then we joined them on Zoom. Uh, and the second one was uh, with uh, going to uh, local health centers and conducting individual interviews with, with key resource personnel on the, and asking them the following questions. Were the tools practical? Did they fulfill their intended functions? And would they work in most sites? So having had, um, having had feedback from, from these two um, uh, meetings with stakeholders, we have developed and finalized a toolkit. Um, it's been translated into Kamaya, and uh, David is going to now take us through uh, some of those key tools. Over to you, David. Thanks. So, um, yeah. So, I think the key the key takeaway we had from this was that we 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 needed to start really as basic as po make it as basic as possible, and. Um, the, the other thing that I didn't point out was we wanted to do this in a way that um, that treated the health center as as a potential nexus of primary care going forward. So the idea was that, well, OK, 
NCD care, you know, using this pen package, we wanted to be able to say, well, whatever you're going to be doing are going to be patterns of care that are going to be consistent with how you're going to be taking care of a whole range of, of problems. Once you get yourself up to speed with diabetes and hypertension, you can start to kind of spread your wings. So, um, so that was really sort of an under, uh, was underneath the, the thought process in developing the toolkit. Next slide. So um, we made several assumptions. I mean, first of all, again, I, that the health center is the focal point for care. So the idea was <clears throat> there are other places, there are other people who have come up with different approaches to dealing with the problem of say diabetes, hypertension, both or whatever, but, um, and, and, and have said, well, you know, what you really need to do is to work at the village level, you know, really at the community level and have, you know, community health workers and so on and so forth. Um, it was clear in our conversations with the Ministry of Health that that was not what their priority was. They wanted there to they wanted the nexus of or the focal point of of primary care ultimately to be the health center, um, and not to, uh, to 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 make it in the community. Not to say that there was not an interest in engaging with community groups who are you know like the village. Uh, uh, there was there there are, there's an entity. Uh, at the village level or entities at some of the village levels to provide services, but they wanted it to be under the, you know, under the organizational structure of the health center. So, you know, the health center would, would be the nexus that they would refer up to the regional hospitals. They would refer down to the, the community, um, uh, to the community groups, to the village level, um, but that they would be the, the, the point of, of organization. Um, the second is that the, uh, as I mentioned, the tools for linking the communities would be considered after the solid relationship was established between the health center and the referral institutions. Um, and, 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 and I'm kind of re reinforcing that point because, um, because I know that, uh, that, that a, lot of the, a lot of the work, including some of the work done by, by our colleagues in, at Duke and US have really focused on, um, on uh, implementing like hypertension programs at the level of, uh, you know, the visiting community health worker. Um, that we assume that medications are available and affordable, a big assumption. But the point is, is that nothing's moving forward unless they're medications. And if until, and, and that the, the government understands and all, all the players understand that that problem has to be solved. So we just assume the problem away. Um, the fourth uh, assumption was, that, um, that we should not be developing tools that restrict how tasks are performed. So the term that normally used in describing these functions are, we had the functions were defined in terms of their, excuse me, the activities were defined in terms of functional specifications, not in terms of the specific means by which services would be provided. So it opens up the possibility that it could be a nurse or you know, it could be another kind of care worker, or it could be something that's that is delegated to somebody in the community. Um, and then finally, the tools addressed essential these essential tasks um, in the pen package, um, and that we recognize that the pen package, in in many ways, is quite is limited. I mean, it is is very much a you know a a, a um, you know a stripped down version of diabetes and hypertension care. But it's better, it's much, I mean, it's, it would be a major accomplishment to implement that. Next. Okay, so th this is just reiterating um, the, the elements of the toolkit and we'll go through each one, uh, one at a time. Going through that, next slide. Um, so the, the list of tools corresponds and you see in the table here, they all get mapped back to one of these actions that we described. And also we describe here who the intended user would be. Um, if, there was a, if there was a physician, we allow the possibility of a physician, but we, we do list the level of the skill level, the minimum skill level that, that for, which the, for which the tool was developed. Uh, what, what kind of a person would need to be involved in filling out that or using that tool? Next slide. So simple stuff, the ID card, this is, um, uh, let me just go to the next slide real quick and sort of what the card is. It's, it's something issued by the staff for any new visitor to the health center. Um, 
again, the goal of this program that we're talking about is anybody who walks in the health center is going to get their diabetes or hypertension problems. If they do indeed have, have those conditions, they're going to have them identified. And if they're willing, they will have a care plan. Um, and to the extent that the care plan can be implemented in the health center will be implemented in the health center. It does not include community-based screening and community-based treatment, okay? So it's all about people walking in the door. The card's issued once, it's, so it's, and it's kept uh, at the clinic, and it's also give, a, a version is given to the, um, to the patient. And uh, next slide is the screening form. Okay, so the screening form was developed specifically with conditions that the pen package says need to be screened for both to identify risk of, of, of vascular disease, but also to identify people who may be candidates for go, to go directly to the regional health center rather than getting their evaluation done uh, primarily in the in the um, in the uh, in the, the 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 health center itself. Next slide. Um, so this risk form then would be filled in by the clinic staff. Uh, again, it, it's it's we'll see in the next one of the next slides that it corresponds to the information that's required to to manage the treatment algorithm. To, inf to manage the treatment algorithm, which is part of the pen package. Um, and again, it's something that could be done in future in conjunction with uh, the village uh, uh, health, what's it called, the VHSG, can you remember? Yeah, the village health support group. Right, village health support group. So that is actually a formal structure that many villages have to, that could be tapped into. But again, after, after you get it organized at the health center, the idea is, Yes, we can then uh, delegate some of this work uh, to the village, village health center in a coordinated fashion. Um, and also we, um, uh, we assume that all of the tests that are part of the screening form can be done in the health center. Currently, not all of them can be. Um, some of them could conceivably be drawn and then sent out, but many of the, many, some of the tests may not be doable in some of the health centers. Next slide. So this is a treatment algorithm. It is. It looks like a mess because it's a lot of different boxes and arrows, but it is as simple as it gets. It basically says you you, you identify whether people are um, are at sufficiently high risk that they need to be seen um, in the regional hospital level, um, and if not, then they're identified um, as to whether they need to immediately be treated or need to be treated, and and then then you know all the follow up and so on and and it even specifies treatment um, me medications although these would necessarily be, need to be modified once it becomes clear what treatments are going to be available um, uh, in Cambodia but amlodipine and hydrochlorothiazide are sort of the mainstays um, of of the the algorithm next slide um, so it, the algorithm is an algorithm. Okay, and it's designed based on the MOH's National Standard Operating Procedures for Diabetes and Hypertension. So this algorithm was reviewed by the, by the Ministry of Health, and it is different, modestly different than the, the WHO PEN algorithm um, because of differences that the Cambodian government or the Cambodian ministry felt uh, made the pen package not the pen algorithm not feasible in uh, in Cambodia. Next slide. Um, and then um, a, a treatment card um, that in order to identify what treatment they would be uh, they'd be receiving. These were the the elements that were required for the algorithm to make a decision about treatment. Um, next slide. Continue. We can go on. Now, again, we're showing them in English. These are all translated in Khmer. Um, and then, the, uh, then the, the lab flow sheet, uh, again, we didn't include any data element that was not part of the protocol. So we never, there was, there no, there's no gratuitous you know, measurement of CPKs or LDHs or any other kind of, kind of blood drawing. These, all of these are specifically required uh, to implement the protocol, the algorithm. Um, and I don't think we have to comment here about this because I don't want to run too, too run over. Um, one of the things that we had a little, I personally had a little difficulty with, um, and, and I kind of 
communicated that to everybody in the group was that you know that the WHO has these these risk based charts, which I find sort of only marginally valuable um, in terms of identifying people who are at different risks for uh, for future development of cardiovascular disease. I mean, frankly, um, I, you know, putting people in those different categories isn't I don't I don't think is necessarily um, all that useful, and they tend to be confusing. But this is as simple as it gets, and it categorized men and women based on what their <clears throat> what their uh, blood pressure is, what their age is, what their um, whether they're a smoker or not, um, and also um, there's a version that has information about their lipid level. Um, again, I find this um, sort of hyper uh, a hyper detailed approach that really doesn't serve the populate probably in my estimation, but you all may have a different opinion. Um, and then, so that was the risk-based chart. Um, and, uh, and then finally, um, for any individual who according to the algorithm should be referred to a referral center, we wanted to develop a form that was going to be easy to understand uh, and e I mean, easy to fill in and also had a feedback component. So the idea is, is that when we visited the health centers, what was clear was that there was a form, and I believe it was a yellow sheet that was given to the patient who needed to be referred to the regional hospital. And they said, go to the regional hospital. They would take that piece of paper and do something with it. They might do nothing. They might not, they might just put it in their pocket, but <clears throat> they might throw it out. Some of the people, some people would go to the regional hospital, but there was an acknowledgement at the health center level that many people don't go because it's inconvenient. So even if they, even if people with very high blood pressure or some degree of symptomatic, you know, heart disease or something potentially symptomatic heart disease, they still would not uh, go. They would not necessarily go. So we wanted to have some mechanism for feedback from the referral institution, um, and basically that's what we say here. Uh, and then finally, there's a, there's a, there's education materials, and this was something that was pretty well developed. And as, as normally mentioned, um, it was something that the groups that had been educated in the pen package um, were, were actually using and finding useful. This particular set of tools comes from one of the VWOs called Mapocho, which is a, a, what seems to be, uh, from the data that we can identify, seems to be a quite successful community-based uh, diabetes or hypertension and diabetes management um, management program at the community level, and it focuses its attention, interestingly, on making sure that drugs are available, but it also basically works at the village level. Next slide. Um, okay, and then prescriptions, nothing new here. Next. Um, now, again, the issue of prescriptions is a mess, okay? So, we have this whole issue about how prescriptions were going to be, where the prescriptions were gonna come from. Currently, very few, if any of the prescriptions are gonna come from the, the, the store the storeroom in the, the health center. I visited the storeroom in many health centers and, and the number of drugs there was, you know, just really, it was just really thin. So there really is no expectation that anybody with say hypertension was gonna get, was gonna get any treatment or very much treatment, you know, maybe two or three days at most of something like hydrochlorothiazide. Um, so really, that is not a currently, it's not a workable mechanism for, for getting drugs to people. So there has to be some other mechanism. And we won't go into the detail about how that would happen. But it is it is the big nasty problem that's going to have to be solved. Uh, and, you know, patient missed visit forms. Um, Again, a lot of this, a lot of the thinking that went into the, the toolkit was um, was making sure that it that that if people were not, if something that was supposed to happen didn't happen, that the 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 health center knew it and they could do something about it. Next slide. Uh, okay, and uh, that's an exit form. Okay. And then there's other tools which I won't go into. There were there are there's something called the Hearts Technical Package, and some of the things you'll see that is in the Hearts Technical Package, which is something developed at the WHO, but is not currently considered a, a toolkit that is 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 feasible in Cambodia. 
that we did take some of the things that were in that toolkit and some of the things that were in the toolkit related to um, management of employees, medications, equipment, and other sort of administrative tasks that are really key to running a health center um, that you know properly, which is you know cash flow projections, budgeting, and so on. So, um, so that those other tools are there, and then also there were some tools that are available for um, assisting in um, in planning how to implement the toolkit. Um, but I think again, those things are. We'll talk about that in a second. Those things were not really adequate for the purposes. I think that the health centers, they were not adequate for the health centers at the level um, of their readiness. Um, so basically where we're up to is, um, is that we, um, uh, we, we want to assess this adapted version in, in pilot studies. And we have a proposal for funding uh, submitted to do that. Uh, we would also then like to go ahead with a pilot study, which actually studies this in, in a community with control sites. Um, and, uh, and then um, at that point, um, we would be doing this in conjunction with the ministry. And, uh, and, and so we would want to then work with the ministry in, in, in helping develop, uh, you know, and with other stakeholders in developing um, a, a rollout plan for other, um, other regions. So, um, so again, the health centers have limited experience. Um, so we're really starting uh, from the bottom of a fairly steep hill um, that, um, that there does need to be some tailoring to local context. However, really at this stage, it's not really a matter of differences in types of health centers. It's really some health centers have a little bit more uh, resources or a, little, a few more staff but basically they're all fairly equally unprepared to implement the, the package. Um, so we have this toolkit. And then the question is, uh, the next stage is, is how to implement it and how to make, how to do it in a practical way. And in that sense, and I won't go into it, is we have been talking about doing it in a form of kind of a, a corporate consulting mode, uh, which would involve um, having teams go out to health centers and work with them in an ongoing way until they get up and running. And then monitor them in the long-term, medium to long-term to, to see that they're maintaining their quality. Um, and the next slide, that's it, thank you. Great, thanks so much, David and Bali. That was great to see kind of the work all brought together. Uh, you could probably stop sharing this thing and we can look uh, at the questions. We did get two questions um, at the registration time. Um, David, do you want to address those? Uh, I think you did kind of talk about it, but just to formally kind of look at those two questions. Um, should I read them out? It's one of uh, the sure. first one. Uh, the first one is, did the mapping comprehensively include barriers and facilitators of current and future built and, nat and natural environmental roles? And as David is an answering these questions, others can please post in the chat and we'll look at them. Well, so to that, I'm, I'm assuming that, that, that what you're talking about then is things like, um, you know, areas for... Um, uh, for recreation, for walking, for, you know, getting around. And um, certainly for, um, you know, in urban Phnom Penh, the issues that they're facing is not too dissimilar from the issues we face in Singapore, but only worse. I mean, because it's harder to walk around in Phnom Penh than it is even in Singapore. Um, but in the, in, 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 but we, but there was, none of the, none of this was, was about prevention from the side of nutrition. Well, I mean, other than education, you know, you know, the, the education includes things like what's good food and how to, and to get good, ex, you know, get exercise and sleep and a variety of other issues. But it was not, there's no, nothing, there was nothing embedded in here that said um, that the program was going to include something like a community-based nutrition improvement program or a, new, or a community based um, uh, program to improve, to increase people's physical activity. And, and the other piece is in rural areas, Frankly, uh, people are pretty, they're pretty, uh, they move around a lot, they walk a lot. Uh, so, um, you know, so I don't know if, if, if that was the, the question that was being asked. The second question 
um, about the challenges in health education and information dissemination. I think that, that the big challenge is, is the, the level of, of health literacy in the community. Um, having said that, I think that Cambodia has been quite successful. The, the whole AIDS program, for example, has been extremely successful, which, which says to me that, that people, once they become aware of the potential implications of their condition and, and what, um, you know, what, what could be done, you know, what the health center can do, that they will take advantage of it. The big barrier was the sense that the health centers really weren't high quality entities that they could, you know, just go for their general health needs. So there does need to be a, 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 a change in people's perception based on a change in the reality on the ground that these health centers actually are places where you can get reliable care for these conditions. Uh, electronic forms is a question about using electronic forms. We did um, uh, initially look into the possibility of electronic forms. There are each of the health centers that we visited and, and, and I believe we also have documentation. They all have a computer usually for registration uh, very spotty um, internet access. So uh, being able to use sort of, you know, national data sort data, data uh, repositories um, is difficult. There generally were not computers that were available, say, in the, in the offices. And so, um, so um, and, and actually there is an initiative going on in Cambodia to change, to implement a, an electronic system at the health center level, which has been, you know, it's sort of like a lot of electronic record programs is taking probably 10 times longer than anybody expected. So we decided not, we, we decided to follow an old rule that, that I was taught many years ago, which is, you know, if you can't do, if you can't do it on paper, you can't do it electronically. So first show you can do it on paper. So we've got paper. And all of, the, all of the tools should be easily translated into an electronic form. I mean, there's really nothing special about them. And, and uh, um, Nancy, would you consider the health center the equivalent of a community clinic? Um, so now, when you mean a community clinic, um, um, it's, you know, so the, do you mean, I don't know if, if the person who's asking this question, oh, it's Aloysius. Is a, 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 it's not like, um, if you say a community clinic is like a polyclinic, these health centers are not polyclinics, okay? There are, there are several notches below polyclinics. There are generally no doctors there. So what services they can provide can only be provided uh, through some sort of a, well, it could be provided by nurses who have been trained and who have some form of supervision by um, by a, a physician and or you know a, or a, a, a nurse practitioner who is registered in a way that allows them to um, to to provide that oversight. So they really are not at that level. In the longer term, I believe, and maybe Cyan, I see you're here, uh, may have some something to say about this. But it, I think in the long term, the notion is is that the health centers would eventually become community. Clinics and and you know my my feeling about it is is that if you're going to have a strong health system, you need a strong primary care system. And if you're going to have a strong primary care system, it's got to be close enough to the people to you know to be accessible and useful. And the health centers are physical entities that exist. Why not take advantage of them and make them the locus of primary care? So I think in the long run, it makes sense for that for the health centers to become the resource entities for primary care, but whether that does happen in the long term, we'll see. Do you have anything maybe, to say? Yeah? No, maybe I'll, I'm looking at the time and we're almost out of time, but maybe I'll ask uh, uh, a question. Uh, we struggled with, you know, there were so many aspects that uh, were challenging uh, as we looked at what was uh, able to be implemented and, uh, you know, the difficulties of doing it. Can you pick out, and I know you work in primary care and so many other settings, so maybe not only the Cambodia setting, if, if you think of even your other work, what's like the biggest challenge? What's the one biggest challenge? Or is, is that too difficult to like? Well, um, 
Well, I think that the biggest challenge at the community center level is getting, I, I would think that is getting the, the people at the community center level, the nurses and, and whatever the other staff really educated properly. I think that, um, I mean, one of the, just to give you a hint of one of the things that kind of made me a little nervous was I said, well, do you measure people's blood pressure? And the answer I got was, we only measure people's blood pressure if their blood pressure is symptomatic. Now, the most common high blood pressure, even very massively high blood pressure, the most common manifestation of high blood pressure is nothing, basically asymptomatic. So the idea that they would only use their blood pressure cuff when people came in with something that they thought might be a blood pressure problem, um, that seemed a little odd. But I think it was a reflection of the fact that, 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 that they really don't take care of NCDs. They take, I mean, they deliver babies, they do vaccinations, they, they do TB, therapy, TB treatment. So they do all the stuff that they're used to quite well, but they need that they, they, this really requires proper, treat, proper training. And then medications. Medications, I mean, I already said, that's a complete mess. Um, all right. Yeah, and that, that is, and that's a daunting challenge. But uh, uh, to wrap up, I think Mala has a question that she'd like to ask. And Mala, go ahead in person, sure. And after that, we will wrap up. Yeah, hi, hi. Uh, David, uh, uh, I have a question, uh, uh, but you know where I'm coming from is from the aged care sector because that's what I'm familiar with. I know there have been community level initiative directed by international agencies with seniors on the ground addressing various issues uh, amongst which are health. So I'm just wondering in the way, uh, I mean, did, did you guys, when you were uh, doing this work, uh, come across um, these initiatives or how um, Mala, you, we've lost you. I think we lost you, Mala, yeah. Able to then work more closely with the community uh, care sector. Well, first of all, I mean, Cambodia is to Cambodia is very young. I mean, it's younger, uh, than, it's it's younger than Singapore. Um, and, it's, and actually, one of the reasons it's not aging as rapidly is because they killed all the people who would be old. Uh, a lot of people, you know, during, during the, you know, killing fields period. So... I think that that they actually don't have quite the the, the stress uh, that we're experiencing, and a lot of other very rapidly aging populations are experiencing. That being said, I, I I don't know of any specific initiatives that relate to aging in Cambodia, but I I and I don't know if normally do you, you or Amina are familiar with any. I I mean I think the idea is is that we're, we're the focus here was going to be more on. You know, people in their middle, you know, mid, mid years, middle life, uh, people, you know, who were who were coming in with their children uh, and that sort of thing, uh, or or people bringing their parents in um, was really what was what the focus was going to be. But but the idea of sort of having like community centers for the elderly, that's not really something that seems to be. Uh, my understanding is there's not there's not a big pressure in that direction. Yeah, and I think. Actually, what I recall is the stress was the fact that it was the young, I mean, not young, young, but young old who were getting a lot of NCDs and having a lot of undiagnosed and untreated conditions, you know. So it was people in their 40s even coming up and suddenly they have a stroke. And so it, it wasn't quite the same age demographic that, you know, you normally think of elderly. Uh, so that was one of the problems is that it's really hitting a lot of your younger population and you're in their productive years and you're losing people. Uh, so there's that dimension. But um, I'm seeing the time, so I will kind of wrap it up. And uh, David, thanks a lot. Uh, there was a lot of information there. I hope people kind of were able to kind of uh, get the range, the wide range of issues that were considered. Nirmali, thanks a lot for all the kind of deep dive in the surveys that you, I know, are so closely involved with. And if anyone has questions, send them in. Uh, we will have all this posted um, on our website. Uh, and um, see you next month, the last Friday of the month, for our next Global Health Seminar Series. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you, Amina. Okay. Bye.